So I'm so happy to be here with you today. And the um, the um, the presentation is on um, cultivation of the heart quality. And we'll hear some words of Pierre Mursha and Hazrat and Night Khan. And then also I'll try to elaborate a little bit with a few stories and we'll do practices that will enhance the experience, I hope. But let us begin with the Sufi invocation of Hazrat and Night Khan with palms pressed together towards the one, the perfection of love, harmony, and beauty, the only being united with all the illuminated souls who form the embodiment of the master, the spirit of guidance. Take the breath that is infused with these sacred syllables and blow it into your palms, the palms of your hand. See it there as light that you bless yourself with. All the illuminated souls, let the spirit of guidance enter us. So what does Anaya Khan say about this subject? He says, besides the training of various professions and occupations, there remains another capacity which is neglected in youth, the cultivation of the heart quality. Today, there's hardly a person there's hardly one person in a hundred whose heart quality has been cultivated. Although instinctively the heart quality is always there, every effort is made to blunt it. Interesting. So he goes on to explain what is the heart quality and he does in fact ask that question in this paper. He says, what is the heart quality? There is intuition. There is inspiration. There is revelation. These are the heart quality. Intuition, inspiration, revelation. All these come from the culture of the heart, from the heart quality. A person may be most cultivated. They may have studied much and yet may not be intuitive. A person may le learn all the techniques of music and poetry without having the heart quality. Now, I'd like to introduce this idea by telling a story, perhaps further illustrate it. And the piece of music that Pierre Moynadine was playing had a, 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 was reminiscent, I don't know if a, Gemma or Mudita have sort of had that feeling, maybe Amin and Khan. Those of you that know Murshid, Pira Murshid Hadai, it's Anayat Khan's music, the son of Anayat Khan's music. Um, but it had some notes, some familiarity and sentiment, sentiment to uh, La Man Antonia. Did you hear it? So I want to tell a story about La Man Antonia. And this story is, uh, I think it was 2005. Uh, there was a composer that was teaching at the Suzuki School of Music. His name was Maestro David Barth. Moinadi, maybe you met him at the Federation gathering, maybe the year before, and maybe 2004 or 2005 uh, in New York. Anyway, he, um, he tells this story. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about this because this is a really a mystical Sufi tale. So it happened that David Bark was living in New York and conducting there and teaching there. And he got on the train to go home. And there was a man with a beard, very distinguished, with a young woman with him. They were very handsome, rather exotic looking, and very, um, there was a kind of peace and a serenity around them. The young woman spoke to David Bark and asked, where are you going? And he said, well, I'm going home. And they said, are you interested in music? Intuition, right? Inspiration. He said, yes, actually, I'm a conductor and a composer and I teach. And they said, would you like to come with us? We're going to a concert. Well, he walked into the Federation 
of the message gathering in New York. And there that evening, they were gonna feature a piece of peer immersive Hadiat and Icon's music known as the La Mon Antonia. Now the La Mon Antonia is very special. And if you like, and I will, I will do this because I think it's important. Um, Hadayat, Mershad Hadayat has dedicated this piece of music to his sister, who many of you know died in um, a concentration camp in um, Germany. She was one of uh, Churchill's Secret Service agents and was over um, the so-called enemy lines. If there are enemies, if there are friends, they're just people. But at any rate, she was captured and imprisoned. So this piece of music is really a biographical piece of music about her, about her youth, about her growing up, about her service, and about her death at her execution. It ends with three very poignant, um, it's, it's done with full orchestra, string orchestra, and um, the end of it are three beats. Very, you know, it's like bump, 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 that's the rhythm. It's meant to indicate her last heartbeats. And the way that sound is created, since it's just a purely string orchestra, is by the striking of the bow on the strings. So back to the story where Mershad Hadayat was, um, so anyway, back, no, first back to the original story. So when um, David Barg heard this music, he, he just immediately knew he needed to offer it at the Suzuki School of Music where he taught every summer. And he, he tells the story and he's told it several times because I've been at several concerts where he's offered this music, he said he went and David Barg is like a six, 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 seven foot man, very large presence. And as you know, Mershav's diet's quite short, five, five maybe at that. And he said he went to Mershav's diet and he kneeled at his feet and, and begged him, may I offer this piece of music at the summer school, the Suzuki summer school in, um, of course, Mershav's diet was so excited about it. Well, out of a series of serious, you know, series of circumstances, um, Merchant Hadai contacted John Pierre, you know, John Pierre at Moynadine in New York, and said, they're doing this in a, it was at a university, it's called Ottawa University in Kansas, in Ottawa, Kansas, this whole big summer school for the Suzuki School of Music's there. So he, anyway, he said, do you know anyone there that could help us find a hotel? And, uh, so he gave uh, him my information and also uh, Murshid Alaudi Nottinger of the Rahaniyat order. And, um, and I wrote back and I said, well, here are my phone numbers. And so as, as it would happen, I, I had a beautiful office at the college, but I was rarely in it. I was like a moving target. But this day I was in my office and I answered the phone and I recognized I didn't have never met uh, Murshid Diet, but I knew his brother. Uh, Pierre Valide and Icon, and I recognized the voice. And I, they ended up coming and staying with us. And every day we would drive to the university, which was about an hour away. It was a great thrill for Joe and myself to host them for about 10 days. So now we're looking at, they're playing the music, Hadayat's there making notes, meeting with the musicians, David Barg's trying to get them attuned to the music. And they are proficient. They are really proficient music musicians. They're watching the conductor. They're watching the music. They're on it. But there wasn't any feeling. There wasn't the heart quality. That's why I'm telling you this big story. So David Barg, he was very, it was growing a little frustrated because he couldn't get this feeling to come. He had the technical proficiency, but that quality, that kind of yearning and this storytelling wasn't coming forth. So he made a bold step. And he told the um, custodial staff, and we, we were in a huge auditorium because this is where it was going to be performed. And all the musicians were on stage. And he said, turn the lights out. And you could hear these musicians going, oh, oh, turn the lights out. He said, close your eyes, feel each other, and feel the meaning of this music. And right now I could cry 
and I have goosebumps because it was so incredibly magical. But that moment was pivotal for those students to understand the essence of not just being technical, technically proficient, but of how to feel that music and express it through their playing. So I hope you'll forgive me for that long story, but I thought it so beautifully illustrated this, this idea of the heart quality. And Merchant will go on to clarify it, but first I'd like to do this wazifa. And it's interesting, I've had a, a, a strange relationship with this wazifa. I've tried to do it before sometimes, and it has made me actually, I don't know if you've had these experiences, I felt uneasy and a, and a little nauseous with this wazifa. I don't know if you've ever had that, but it wasn't the right time. It's like perfume. Sometimes it feels sound, smells so beautiful to you, and other times it doesn't, or incense. It was like that with this wazifa. But for this class, for this month, it was the perfect... Moin, your music's playing, dear. Okay, it was the perfect wazifa. And the wazifa is ya wa dud. Emphasis on the D at the end. Ya wa dud. And you know, this wazifa is so special and so um, it's just pure love. And it and it does mean it's the divine name that means the one who loves. And it's the one who is the source of all love and of loving kindness. And if you know, if you know about loving kindness from the Buddhist perspective. That's this wish and prayer that all beings be happy, that all beings have everything uh, that they could possibly need and want and desire satisfied in the highest regard. It's also this wish, may everybody find this happiness before me. I will wait. I will postpone my own fulfillment and happiness until all others are fulfilled. So it's a depth of great love, if even a kind of sacrifice. And we'll talk about that a little bit later because it will relate to another practice, this idea of self-sacrifice in the, the most beautiful way. So let's do this practice. Can we, and can we kind of intone it? And we'll, you know, typically I ask uh, the people in our, our, our Sufi circle to do the practices 101 times a day first, 34 times aloud, prefix with ya, meaning O divine, O sublime, and then followed by the name. And then 34 on a, a so that would be zikr aloud. And then thicker would be whispering the practice just with the sacred name without ya. And then 33 times thicker as here, just mm, sort of um, trying to retain the atmosphere of that practice within. So let's do this. And maybe just listen to me. I'll do maybe three of them and then we'll begin again for 33. So let's do it together. Moin, your um speak your um you need to maybe mute, mute your microphone for me. Thank you. Make sure you're muted or we'll get a dyssynchronistic sound. And if you want to mute me, you can do that too on your sound on your own computer. <clears throat> ya wa dood. Ya wa dood. Ya wa dud Ya wa dud Now, I'm parsing for a moment. I want you to close your eyes as if you're one of those musicians in that auditorium and feel this vibration in the atmosphere tuned to all the times this sacred name has been on the lips of so many beings. And let's tune to each other around the world because we really are encircling the globe, our planet. And let's encircle it with love and listen to the sound deeply. Let it resonate deeply in your being. Feel it in your deep heart, dispersing to every cell of your being so that every cell is both sipping 
and singing this beautiful sound. Yawadud, 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 Yawadud. Yawadud, 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 Yawadud. Yawadud, 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 Yawadud. Yawadud, 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 Yawadud. Notice the atmosphere around you. Notice any sensations you may have in your body. Thoughts, feelings, sensations. I'd like to continue with Mershid's words. He says, Heart quality is something which must be developed within oneself. And when no attention is given at the time of youth to developing that particular quality, what happens when a person is grown up? He asked. What happens when a person grows up? They will be selfish, proud, mannerless, and not ready to sacrifice. A person believes that these characteristics guard their interest. A person believes that these qualities, being selfish, proud, mannerless, and not able to sacrifice, is um, regarded as guarding their self-interest, the me-first attitude. And one says of such a person that they have common sense, that they're not interested in these unworldly manners. They have common sense, they're reasonable people, and that they're practical people. But if everybody were like that, what could one expect of life except constant conflict as there is today? Now, of course, Mershad was speaking these words and giving these teachings somewhere between World War I and World War II. But ever so much true today, we see this in our world, in our politics, in our divisions. And that's why this message is so very important. It unifies people. And we may know this from our in our deep heart that this was our longing and we are so fortunate to have found each other to found a community that understands us 
and feel I'm looking at all of you. I'm looking at the top of my screen as I'm looking at you, but how, how, how beautiful is it that somehow out of this whole big universe, um, we have found the message and the message has found us and we have found each other. What a great blessing that is. Murshid goes on to say, religion or the devotional side of a person's nature is also dying out for the reason that the heart quality is lacking. Even if people go to church or another place of worship, their piety is intellectual. Yeah, thank you. So again, even if people go to church or to another place of worship, their piety is intellectual. I think we all understand that, perhaps have experienced it. People can only enjoy something intellectual. This is where people put value. Of course, that's important. But Mersha puts it in the context um, that uh, us studying, you know, let's uh, excelling in our higher education or in a trade or in, in business is merely a reflection of our inner life. And that through that concentration and mastery, we can apply that to our spiritual life. So it's not just for a material gain. There can be a spiritual gain from that as well. And Mershit's very clear about that. So Murshid goes on to say, Hazrat and Night Khan, I'm referring to as Murshid, M-U-R-S-H-I-D. When there is a mathematical explanation of something, it is wonderful. But it, when it comes to feeling blessed and uplifted, to feeling the raising and lifting of consciousness towards the higher spheres, they cannot experience for they live in their intellect. So there's a, a, an obstacle, an obscuration that doesn't allow that knowledge, whatever it could be, even worldly, worldly knowledge to enter a deeper place and inform that deeper place. Hazrat Knight Khan goes on to say, what is generally known and experienced by the average person today is what is called sensation. All the beauty that one sees of line or color, all that one sees with the eyes or that one tastes and touches. It's just sensation to a lot of people. It is, a, it is living in sensation that makes an individual material. And so also constant seeking of that stimulation for sensation that's can make one a kind of addict to it. It can be uh, really to very much to one's detriment. Those are my words. Back to Mersha. It is living in sensation that makes an individual material. And after some time, such a person becomes ignorant of spirit. That's so sad because that's such a big part of who we are. But if we remain, it remains obscured and not experienced. We're really only half living, half alive, if even that. So Murshid goes on to explain these, um, these different experiences of the soul. And he says this, the soul can go through four different experiences, which are, excuse me, the soul can go through four different experiences, which are all in reality, the longing of the soul. So when we move just beyond sensation and and maybe you can think of it this way um when you learned a new practice or perhaps those of you that do zikr with others at first it's it's a um a sensation we're hearing the words we're doing the movements but then what happens is it goes into this very deep place and this this sense of exaltation arises and Mershid explains exaltation which is a greater bliss a higher pleasure which makes an individual independent of the outer life of happiness. Does not seem to be known by the majority. Again, perhaps as you were seeking the spiritual path, you maybe felt isolated and a little alone 
till you found your beloved companions. It can be like that. But part of it is that journey uh, into the desert, so to speak, like Jesus did, that aloneness to then find something true and lasting. And Murshid says, what is exaltation? He asked the question. The soul can go through different experiences, which are in reality, the longing of the soul. I think I've repeated myself. Well, one of them is that the first is exaltation. He explains the next as knowledge. Knowledge can be learned by closing not only the eyes. We do that practice, Chagall, where we close our senses. Knowledge can be learned by closing not only the eyes, but also the mind from the outside world. Those of you that have had the opportunity for retreat, uh, this was something my sister and I talked when she was isolated in her room in an ashram in, in Rishikesh. This is a great, it's a, a suffering, yes, but a great blessing to have this form of isolation to turn within, to try to rise above this pain. So it's turning within. Murshid calls it the inner life. Some of us have experienced that if you've done a solitary retreat or you've led a solitary life, or if you were in isolation during COVID, it becomes, we tune within. We would tune within. One of my Sufi friends um, is a woman. She was conveying to me that the first time she had to go to an airport to fly, she almost didn't. And she's someone that travels quite a bit. It was like, oh, I found it very difficult. I almost felt like I'd gone feral in COVID, but well, there's some benefit of that. You know, there's some benefit of that. We get really tuned within. So uh, the next stage, the third stage of this longing of the soul is in search for happiness. And Murshid says, the third thing one's ex one experiences in life and for which the soul yearns is happiness. That can be gained by also getting in touch with oneself. Well, how does one do that? How does one get in touch with oneself? Hopefully the practices draw you inward. Hopefully tuning to those practices help to open parts of our being. But folks, let me tell you, there's a lot of veils that we, um, biases, views, belief systems. There's a lot of those things that we would call them veils that we kind of want to keep working at removing them. I remember Mershad Diet. While he was in one of his visits in Kansas City with us, he gave the teachings on the purification breaths. And he said, it's so important to do those breaths every day because throughout the day, we accumulate all kinds of impressions. And, you know, we hear so much, we're bombarded with information, but these pra practices can help to remove those and clarify it so we can be in touch with oneself. So those practices, which... To my knowledge, every Sufi is given when they first enter the path is a practice, a lifelong practice to be done. Purification breaths. Now, to know thyself, to thine own self be true, to know thyself. It said, I think uh, Socrates said, uh, know thyself and I will know the universe. I think uh, Pythagoras said, know thyself and that thou, thou shall know the universe and God, he emphasized. Um, a few years back, Joe and I were in Greece and we went um, to Delphi, the site of the Oracle of Delphi. It's a footpath that goes very high up, but there's only a part of that left. But on the pediment in Greek, and I'm fortunate to travel with my brilliant and loving husband, who can read Greek and tra translate Greek and Latin for me when we travel. Um, it says, know thyself. How interesting is it that at this place of the Oracle, it would say, know thyself. People would go there to find out more about themselves, but know thyself, know thyself. And of course the Oracle would have to be very clear in order to bring forth useful information. Know thyself. Great teachings by Murshid, um, Murshid an icon, Pure Murshid an icon on reflection and projection. Because every day we are dealing with reflections from others, projections from others. They enter us, they arise. We don't even know where they've come from. Know thyself. 
do the inner work. It helps very much to know thyself. So that, Merchant says, comes from happiness. Happiness comes from being in touch with oneself. I like to always remind myself. Um, I mean, I read the biographies of people that interest me. And of course, you know, I've studied Sri Aurobindo's teachings and I'm very interested in, um, of course, Gandhi's teachings on nine violence and um, Nelson Mandela, what he accomplished. But you know, every single one of those men, and there were probably numerous women who've never been named, they gained their enlightenment in imprisonment. They were imprisoned in the worst possible prisons they could have been in, some for years upon years. And in that isolation, in that duress, in their punishment, they turned within. That's where they got their strength. And that's when these great teachings came forth and they became shining examples for humanity. Rumi says, when God takes everyone away from you, consider it a great blessing because then you're left there alone with God. So turning within. So the fourth aspect of this longing of the soul is peace. It cannot be gained by outer means, by outer comfort and rest alone. It can only come when the mind is at rest. Where is that still point within? The refuge, the true refuge. And what resides there? It's the seed of God. It's the blessing of our existence. So Mershid goes on to say, mistakenly, a person does not seek those four experiences, but instead, one experiences something else. For instance, it is a constant yearning of the soul to experience happiness. And instead of that, it becomes connected to what one calls pleasure. Again, you go to the database and it's on our website under links, hazrat-anayat-khan.org. Seek those words. Um, pleasure, pain, happiness, exaltation. Look at those. Um, they might be considered uh, polarities or opposites, but see what he says about that. So pleasure is only the suggestion. Happiness is the reality, he says. Pleasure is only the suggestion. Happiness is the reality because, you know, when we have these momentary pleasures and they're taken away, then what happens? You know, we go bounce between happy, sad, happy, sad, happy, sad. I have something new. Oh, I'm happy. Oh, now it's getting old. Now I'm sad. I really like someone. I have this great friend. Oh, they've gone away. Now I'm sad. I've accomplished this one thing. Oh, now what? You know, I have, I taught college my whole life. And I have to tell you, many of my students <laughs> freaked out. There's certain times a year, especially they do, when they say, you know, I've accomplished everything I'd hoped to accomplish as a designer. I have a great job. I'm working with great clients. I'm making great money, but I'm not, it's, that's not it. What else is it, Steph? They call me Stephanie. They knew that I had, you know, I had pictures of Dalai Lama, Gonda, Murshid, you know, Tonka's in my office. So they knew something was going on. So they feel they can call me and ask me that question because they're really, you know, it's that what, what's it all about Alfie moment. And that, you know, I tell, I give them some advice and, you know, they review these teachings and, you know, we talk about it, that it's within, it's within. I mean, it's great that they're doing all those wonderful things, but after that, then what? Okay. Pleasure is only the suggestion. Happiness is the reality. So I'd like to do this practice. We've done it for several months now, but we've been talking about this, this deeper side of life. And so please don't get bored with it, those that are in our circle, and just try to go deeper with it. It's the Ishq Allah, Mabud Allah. Ishq Allah, Mabud Allah. A few words. When we start to, maybe we could say deconstruct um, this uh, beautiful practice. Ishq is this unconditional love. Unconditional love. It's not contingent on anything. 
It just is. In Buddhism, they have this word, it's called isness. It just is. It can't be debated. It can't be disputed. There's no dialects that we can go through to get to it. It just is. So this is ishk. This isness of love, unconditional love, not contingent on anything and far above any kind of sentimentality. Now, Allah means simply God. It translates that way, but I love it. You know, I learned to speak a little bit of Arabic while living in the Middle East and all means the, and law means no. So it's like the no, the no, the no. But this is also a beautiful practice because we have it. I think and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's neti, 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 meaning that not that, not that, not that, not that. It's a distillation to get down to the essence of who we are, to know thyself. It's kind of looking maybe at the external world and realizing that we're not that, not that, not that. I'm not that. I'm not that. Okay. Well, Allah also means the essence of all things. Everything is infused with Allah. Everything exists because of Allah. And yet, God doesn't depend on anything. So, it also is an absolute state of what's called dat, D-H-A-T. We often refer to that or it's transliterated as zat. What is that? It's this singularity and it is everything at the same time. I always, you've heard me say it before, it's like that singular moment before the Big Bang. It's that deep, deep kind of pressure point, this um, like cataclysmic shift in something that allows everything else to burst forth. And that universe is uh, as now, what's that new? It's Hubble. Joe, do you remember what's the new telescope? Huh? Web. What, what is it? Web. Webb, is it Jim Webb? They're kind of named it after him. James. James, James Webb. I think I heard him called Jim. But, you know, that's even going farther into space and showing us more of what of this universe exists that we had no idea was out there, but it's also self-creating. So we can be like that. We can get in touch with that. It's not, bam, be self-creating, renewing, revivifying, regenerating. You know, let's do it. Allah is infused with that. And again, you know, I turn to the, my understanding and experience in Buddhist studies with my beautiful teacher, His Eminence, Kamtul Rinpoche, and of course, His Holiness Dalai Lama. And they talk a lot about beginningless and endless time, beginningless and endless time. And those of you that are Catholic will recognize this part of this prayer that begins with the glorification of the Trinity. The Trinity is something that exists in many traditions. We see that emerge um, in Hinduism, Buddhism, you know, Catholicism, there's many, many. But it, the prayer concludes this idea of beginningless and ending, endless time says, as it was in the beginning and ever shall be, world without end, amen. As it was in the beginning and in the end, and ever shall be world without end, amen. That same idea, a sort of self creating possibilities. Mabud means the one who we worship and we adore. One who we worship and we adore. And then we return to Allah. Now, I'm going to share my screen for a moment. And I think, Moinadine, are you, you're not sharing screen any longer, right? Okay, so I'm going to shift here for just a moment. Give me a second. Let me see if I can find the file. Okay, it may start with some sound, which I'll stop because I want to explain a little more. No, that's good. Can you see that beautiful rose? Can you yes. see the heart within the rose? Yes. Isn't it beautiful? Okay, so now... I'd like to share with you something called the singing wazifa. There's this whole collection of wazifas. Merchant Diet never was able to complete it before his passing. 
but he worked with a wonderful musician in Canada. His name is Mersha uh, Jalaluddin Sill. His um, given name is Gary Sill, S-I-L-L. -L. You can look him up. Oh my God, try to get on his mail list. He he just has, he writes the most beautiful music. But Mersha Dai worked with him. He composed what's called the Singing Mozifas. There's a whole collection. Um, I will, uh, uh, there's actually a link to those again on our website under links. So you can go there and look at the practices. Beautiful site, very well developed with esoteric practices. But what Mersha Dai brought forth regarding this practice is that the purpose, as we know, is to seek and bring forth love. The meaning is simply, we've heard it, God is love, lover, and beloved. The quality is radiance. I mean, look at this, although we see the folds, the heart, but there's a radiance to this rose. The element is fire. So there's this sense of, of passion, but also fire has a, has a way of illuminating, illuminating our path, illuminating the darkness, Fire is also rises. So there's this feeling of inspiration and aspiration. Mursha Tadayat um, asks us to consider concentrating at the forehead. And of course, the color is red. Now, we're going to play this. We're going to listen to it. I think the beginning, just, just kind of introduction, there might be a, a little ding, like a, you know, a triangle. And then, but you'll, you'll catch the tune. You'll hear the syllables. I'll sing it. If my voice is distracting to you, mute me for a time being. Um, when the image goes away, I'll be talking again so you can turn your sound back on. All right, here we go. <laughs> Can I get a few shaking heads? Can you hear that well? It, it's okay. It, it seems to be breaking up a little. Uh, can you put on original um, sound for musicians? Uh, I'm going to stop for a moment. I'm going to go back here. Um, hold on. Let me go back. Better? Yes, better. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
So this is concluding the class, and I would like to offer a dedication of merit. If anything of benefit has occurred today in this gathering, please let it resound throughout the universe with loving kindness, offering comfort to those who need comfort food to those who need food, a place to rest their heads for those who need rest, for abiding happiness, not contingent on outer circumstances. That strife amongst people may cease. That strife within, within us may cease. that all beings be well and happy. Soha. And then the prayer of Hazarat Pir Murshid Anayat Khan, Khatum. O thou who art the perfection of love, harmony, and beauty, the Lord of heaven and earth, open our hearts that we may hear thy voice which constantly cometh from within. Disclose to us thy divine light, which is hidden in our souls. Disclose to us thy divine light, which is hidden in our souls, that we may know and understand life better. Most merciful and compassionate God, Give us thy great goodness. Thy great goodness. 
Teach us thy loving forgiveness. Thy loving forgiveness. And raise us above the distinctions and differences which divide, as Mershad wrote, men. Send us the peace of thy divine spirit. And unite us all thy perfect being. As we open, cup your hands, fill it with light of this sacred prayer and let it be poured over and within your being. Amen. Um,